so people cannot hear me? I can't hear? Oh, we're going. Oh, all right. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, 2018 Summer Webinar Series. My name is Craig Kennedy. I'm the Executive Director of ACU. Um, this is our first webinar of the, of the season, so I apologize for uh, not getting started exactly on time <laughs> as Mariah Blake, our staffer, hit go. I was sitting there saying, okay, can they hear me or not? But uh, apparently you can. Um, today's program is with Cindy Barr of Capital Inc. on creating effective spaces for primary care teams. We're extremely excited to have uh, Cindy on the line. I just want to go over a couple of quick things before we get, uh, get Cindy rolling. Um, ACU is a nonprofit transdisciplinary organization focused on the recruitment and retention of clinicians in underserved areas. We were founded by National Health Service Corps alumni um, 21 years ago. And so we focus on recruitment and retention from that founding. And we have projects like our Star Center Workforce Project, our advocacy for the National Health Service Corps, and training and technical assistance for clinicians of all sorts um, across the spectrum. Um, Supporting those clinicians in the field is what we hope to do with our efforts here at ACU, and that's what this series is really meant to um, meant to focus on, which is supporting clinicians in a variety of ways. You'll see the four different ones in our series this summer are based on our highest ranked sessions over the um, in our last conference, uh, but all very different, right? All very different sessions of those four different. Um, uh, webinars coming up. So we're very happy to have um, Cindy Barr with us today to get it started. Um, I hope you use ACU as a learning resource. We have a whole bunch of stuff on our website. We have a whole bunch of stuff at the Star Center. Um, and we're really into um, helping, like I said, helping clinicians in underserved communities, whether through our webinars, our resources, our conferences, our trainings, or just in person. If you can you should feel free to give us a call at any time, um, buzz us and see how we can be most helpful. Um, this webinar series is put together is in partnership with our sponsor Centene Corporation. They have been very supportive of ACU for the past several years and have been a sponsor of the webinar series since the beginning of this webinar series, so a couple years back when we got it started. So thank you very much to Centene Corporation. Um, we work with them on a number of different projects. This is just one of them, and we are uh, happy with our partnership with them and look forward to continuing and expanding that going forward into the future. Um, as I mentioned, I am Craig Kennedy. This is my contact information. You do have these slides in the right-hand side of the webinar today. You can download the slides so you can you can have my email address and Mariah Blake's email address and our phone number there. Um, email us, call us, look for us any way, shape or form. We'll be happy to be as helpful as we possibly can. Um, today, Mariah will be handling the technical side of the webinar. Uh, so if you're having any problems with the technical side, either use the chat box, the dashboard, email her directly, whatever you can do. We want you to have a positive experience through this webinar. So just as a, as, a, uh, <laughs> as a point of fact, we are recording this webinar today. We'll follow up with an email with a link to access the recording to everybody, and we'll also be sharing it with more folks in the field so more folks can learn from this webinar as well than those that just on the line today. The good thing about being on the webinar today is you get to ask questions live of Cindy. So that makes it, thank you for joining us, um, but it will be available to everybody out in the field as well. Um, so that we can spread that information far and wide. One CME credit will be awarded for today's webinar. We have a, we're asking for approval for that from AAFP, but we have submitted and applied for one CME credit. So if you do want CME credit for this webinar, um, please send an email to Mariah Blake. Again, that slide previous with Mariah Blake on it, and we will register you. You know, we have to prove that you sat through the webinar, and then we'll put you in for that one hour of CME credit. I do want to let you know that webinars are meant to be interactive, um, so please ask questions. Um, as you can see on this slide, raise your hand, use the chat box, questions. Um, the purpose of here isn't just to listen to it, but to be able to ask Cindy, I, or Mariah questions about the content or anything that's happening. That's the, that's the fun part of the webinar. 
So um, otherwise, we could have listened to it at any time in the future and just listened to it. But here we get to be interactive. So we'll be taking note of all the questions that you type in the chat box or question box or wherever you put it over there on the side. And as Cindy's going through, we will we'll get those together and then pose them of Cindy going forward. So please do be an active participant. There, there are no questions that, uh, that um, are too small to address um, about any part of this. Um, and we'll make sure the right person can answer it, you know, Cindy, I, or Mariah, based on what kind of a question is. So please stick around to the end. We do have a fantastic presentation for you today. And there's the joy of an evaluation at the end. <laughs> so there's a form at the end of the webinar that we'd love to have you fill out about um, suggestions and feedback on today's presentation and also to suggest future topics for future webinars. We do have the four in this session lined up, um, but you know what? We'll do whatever needs to be done or whatever good suggestions are out there. Happy to have webinars on those going forward and we'll find those experts and we'll get them get that information out to you so um, please stick through to the end so that we can um, have your feedback on how this presentation went how the webinar went and what kind of sessions we should have in the future so without further ado i think we're on to cindy barr who is the operations and facility planner at capital link um, Capital Link is a is a good partner of ACU, one of our one of our friendliest of partners in the cooperative agreement space. There are a bunch of cooperative agreements out there to help health centers with a variety of different aspects of their operations. But even beyond health centers themselves, Capital Link and ACU help a range of folks um, serve underserved populations in in the best possible manner. Today, obviously, Cindy will talk about creating effective spaces how you as a provider, hopefully you may be a provider, you may be administrator, you may be any number of things on this phone call, um, how you can work to create effective spaces for your primary care teams to be effective, most effective um, in caring for the patients and populations you serve and the communities you serve. So we're very excited. I will tell you the way we selected these sessions were the highest attended and highest rated sessions of our conference. No pressure, Cindy. But uh, but as a highest attended and highest rated session, we are very excited to have you here um, and uh, and look forward to seeing the full presentation. So without further ado, I'll, I'll send it over to Cindy to run through her presentation. And again, feel free to type in questions in the chat box in the question box over to the, the side there while she's speaking and we'll get them at the end. Cindy. Well, thank you for that very gracious introduction. And I am delighted to be here. Uh, delighted to be at the conference, but also very delighted to be able to share this information via webinar as well. So I only want to echo Craig's encouragement for questions. Uh, there is a lot of material we're going to cover. I encourage you to look at it kind of like flipping through a magazine, where at the end of the magazine, you kind of say, oh, now I know what that was about. And then you may go back and look at a particular article or look at a particular item in more depth. And we are always available even after the webinar to answer your questions by a phone or email. So I will also have contact information at the end of the presentation. But for today, I want to really talk about the fact that we are going to look at spaces, not so much what you have, but how you use what you have. Um, Looking at the space your team works in is integral to aligning the people that are there, the processes they use, and the place that they use uh, those processes in. So if you can, if you keep working, working, working on your staffing, and you keep working on your scheduling, and you keep working on your patient visit process, but you feel like you're not getting anywhere, Step back a little bit, and that's what the next hour is for. Let's look at the place and see if we are using our spaces effectively. In the diagram you see on your screen right now, there's 120 square feet on both the right and the left. Imagine there are hallways at the top of the screen and the bottom of the screen. On the one on the left, we've taken that 120 square feet and we've created two walk-in closets. They can carry all kinds of carts, 
we can put all kinds of boxes in there. We can have all, a lot of stuff we just want to hide away, as we often do. The one on the right, however, we took the same 120 square feet. We opened it up and created a passageway with a whole row of shelving with bifold doors for storage. Very different storage areas, both storage, both the same amount of square feet, but with different processes and with people using them in different ways. And that's really the heart of what we want to explore as we go through spaces specifically for patient care teams. We're going to look at facilitating this alignment with our engagement areas. Where does the team engage with patients and families? Where do they work together as a team? And how are they functioning as a team? What are some of those common stressors? And what about the role of respite? So we'll look at all of these areas. First, creating a place to engage with patients and families. We have made a lot of progress over the last couple, three decades in how we look at primary care, how we really stress preventive care, how we're monitoring our chronic disease uh, patients. But some things haven't changed so much, specifically our waiting areas. Uh, in many ways, from a patient experience standpoint, they are just still coming into a big room, sitting on those benches and still waiting. So the entry experience is really important to how you work as a team because it sets the tone for the patient of expectations and also their own stressors as they walk into engagement areas. But we haven't really changed engagement areas too much either. When we actually meet with a patient face-to-face, that's generally done in an exam room where there's basically you, me, and the table. Now we dress it up sometimes with windows. We try to put artwork in. As years have gone by, we have more and more technology. So now we, instead of holding a blood pressure cuff or holding an otoscope, we might have them mounted to the wall. We have computers instead of paper charts. But essentially, it's just you and me and the table in many respects in the same room that was there years and years ago. That actually works. And I don't wanna minimize the role of the exam room, but I do want us to kind of think beyond just the table for a while and see if as our patients have changed, as our plan of care has changed, are there more effective ways that we might use the square footage that we're given? One of those is to think beyond that table and think more about the the whole role of the medical recliner. Uh, we have done several studies, one of them is cited here, where it shows that in FQHC primary care, about 50% of patients don't really require exam tables. Why is that important? Because exam tables don't really put us at eye level with the patient if we're sitting. So we're standing all the time so that we are at eye level. Then we're not at eye level with the other guests in the room. And as there are more and more people with patients in the room, rather they're more seniors with caregivers or more kids with parents and grandparents, eye level contact is really, really important. Uh, and then there's just the safety and the comfort. I would much rather put an elderly patient uh, in a recliner that I could tip back if I needed to listen to their heart than to try to put them on a traditional exam table. So rethink how you are outfitting those traditional exam rooms that you have. And are we really using the space effectively for our changing population? Likewise, we might want to think outside of that traditional exam room. So we're seeing more and more zoned exam rooms, where, as you see on the left, there are areas that are for consultation, education, behavioral health warm, uh, handoffs. And then there's a specific area for the physical exam. On the right, we have what's called Jack and Jill rooms. They are in the same footprint as the exam rooms you have now, except you can move from one to the other without going out in the hall. So it creates more of a circular flow between there again, that consultation, education, warm handoff concept and the actual physical exam. If only half of the the visits that we do really require the table. We may spend most of our time in those rooms that are shown here on the right and the left. And would a discussion around a table be more effective? 
I can't answer that question, but your team can answer it for the population they've been given to manage. You could try this in your existing spaces, so you don't need to renovate the whole place and then hope it works. The most underutilized room that I see is the procedure room in primary care. Unless you have specialists coming in or you have a day that you do a lot of procedures, generally that room is really a glorified exam room with lots of extra storage. In fact, sometimes I'm even asked to put up curtains or put up screens. How can you hide this stuff behind here because the kids are all getting in all our equipment when we use this room? Well, my answer to that is, well, maybe we're just not using the room correctly. Maybe there's something better we could do with it. You can actually transform an existing procedure zone consultation room by looking at the area that I've denoted by the two stars. If you have a door on one and you have a sink on the other end, you could divide that room into a zoned exam room and see if it works better. So before you actually do anything to the walls, the doors, anything like that, let's see if we can just put a curtain up and see how zoned exam rooms work for us. Likewise, our office and consult rooms in the clinical area um, need to be arranged in a way that supports and is aligned with what's going on in that room. These are two rooms to show an example of that where you have the exact same furnishings in both 10 by 10 rooms, but a very different atmosphere depending on who's going to be using that room. Is it something more authoritarian, such as on the right? Is it something a little bit more collegial, maybe even a peer counselor on the left? Encourage the staff members to rearrange rooms so that they work, keeping, as I've just shown with the red arrow, control of the door. I think it is really important that the staff person does not kind of get themselves behind a desk at the back of the room, but there are still variations you can do by keeping control of the door. And then most importantly, keeping eye contact with all the seating in the room. So not arrangements where at any time you would have your back to the patient. Keeping those two principles in mind, there are lots of different ways that you can rearrange existing furnishings in the same room, but to have a very different environment for the work that's going on in that room. You also need a place for groups. Uh, I've labeled eight different elements for success here. Uh, you can read those, I won't read them for you, but I do wanna point out a couple really important ones. And one is that if you're doing shared medical appointments or a group medical visit, it is important to have a directly accessible exam room um, or a quiet consultation room adjacent to your group room. So please don't put your groups down in the basement or way in the back of the building or somewhere far from the clinical area because that's where we have a free conference room. Because it's really difficult from a flow standpoint to have that one-on-one -on -one consultation with a patient that is optimal for a shared visit. The other is that you want to have restrooms there. You want to be able to manage a basic specimen. Um, make them functional for a group uh, visit, just like you would do if it was a one-on-one -on -one individual visit. Think through the spaces that you choose and think, can I actually meet all of the needs of the patient? And can I facilitate the work of the group and of the provider in this space and locate it appropriately? The other is this concept of having direct access from a common area. So you do not wanna to have to walk all the way through the clinic area with your kind of single file of people for groups, whether it's a, a peer learning group or it's a shared medical appointment, it's important to have that um, off of a common area. I'm often asked about how to right size group spaces. I've put some square footage per person, so PP is per person, that we use when we are creating new spaces or building new buildings. The point of these numbers is not so much for you to memorize them, although they're certainly available for reference, but to see how when you change the type of work in the room, the number of people you can accommodate in that room goes down. And so when you start putting in conference tables, when you, as opposed to putting in classroom tables, 
the number of people go down. Think about how flexible your space is and think about aligning the way the space is arranged with the amount of square footage that you have. So we've talked a little bit about engaging with the patient, both in individual exam rooms, um, in zoned exam rooms, in group areas, in consultation areas, but what about the work of the team? We need to create a place for teamwork, and many, many health centers have gone to a larger uh, team room where all of the members of the interdisciplinary team are now working in one room. We're going to kind of explore that a little bit so that you can understand what only what you have created, but also maybe what you need to create in order to align your people and your processes with your space. This is not so much a recommendation of one model over the other as it is an understanding of what you have so that you're not fighting your space, but you're working with your space. The first is to realize that the team is not always working all together. These workspaces need to accommodate focused work as well as collaborative work and group work. And they do need to be designed to reduce stress and not to increase stress. I talk to providers a lot who say the most stressful part of my job is trying to work in the team room. It should be the opposite. Actually, that should be the place of encouragement, the place of collaboration, the place of really feeling refreshed to go to the next difficult patient. So how can we turn that around? One is to understand location. Is it on stage or off stage? And on stage and off stage is in, re in relationship to the stage, which is where we engage with patients. So wherever we're engaging with patients, that's our stage. And whether we're on stage, so we're right there in the engagement area, or we're off stage somewhere to the side, that changes the way the team dynamics are and the way that the team workspace works. The other is this concept of distributed versus consolidated, and that's referring to the team. So do we have the team in different places based on the tasks that they're doing, or are they all in one place? We've seen, as I mentioned, a movement towards being consolidated. What are the implications of that? And what are the downfalls of that that we need to address in order to optimize consolidated team areas? So the first type is an on-stage team room. The basic layout is this purple team work area in the center, which is surrounded by engagement areas where we engage with patients, and then a patient entry. So think, blue patient entry, green engagement areas, purple teamwork. You're going to see that in several slides as we go through. What that looks like in a basic ballroom is this picture on the right of a workspace which is fairly open with exam rooms on the side. The highlighted area on the diagram on the left is the picture you see on the right. So the staff are actually working the ballroom in the center. We call it ballroom because you can basically be all around the edge and watch the staff work. You can have different levels of privacy in that ballroom. You can have it all the way open, more like what we would see in an emergency room in a hospital. You can have partial privacy, which is what you see in the pictures, or you can actually have walls that go all the way to the ceiling, maybe just with some view light. So the, the amount of privacy is something that you need to gauge based on the amount of noise and uh, the work that's being done within the space. You can also have on-stage teams that kind of push that teamwork and the entry together. So the patient entry and the teamwork are in one space. You can see this in the picture where notice all the way at the end of the picture, there's a little window, and that's where the reception and check-in area is. So the team is working with the reception and phone people. Really important if those people are part of the team. So if you put your receptionist and your team purse on the team, it's really nice if you can push those spaces together. If the reception, check-in, phone, business area is a separate team, it's very awkward for that person to be sitting there listening to all this conversation and they don't really belong to that team. They kind of feel like a fifth wheel. 
So if you have this set up, please make that person part of the team. If you don't have this set up, give that person another team to be part of. The way that you can adjust this in existing space is often with medical record space. In this diagram, you can see how we have kind of the front office and then we have the back office, which is highlighted in pink. If we move that to the old medical records room, now all of a sudden we have everyone co-located. Now, instead of off stage and separated, we have them together on stage. So think about the spaces that you currently have, particularly small satellites. Is there a way that you could move the space around so that people could be uh, working together and we could get rid of that wall between front and back? The other basic layout is the offstage team room. So patient entry in the front, team work in the back, and we meet with the patient in the middle. The one difference I think uh, in this very common layout that we have now with team rooms is that everybody in that teamwork area is together in one room. I wanted you to see this picture for one reason. I have, we have all the people looking at each other and knowing what's going on in the room. I often see people try to avoid that to try to make it quieter. So they line people around the perimeter of the room and what happens is that everybody tries to kind of pretend no one else is around and you lose the advantage of the fact that you put them all in the room together. It decreases conversation and collaboration. You don't know if somebody is busy or not because you can't see their face. So if you are going to do an all together offstage room where conversation can be tolerated, please make it so that people can see each other. It doesn't have to be exactly this layout as you see, the one on the left is kind of a, uh, an island in the middle of the room with people sitting all around. On the right-hand side, there's a peninsula off the wall with people looking at each other. It really helps. And we're gonna talk about some other problems that it solves in a few more slides. On stage and off stage can sometimes be combined. And you may have some sites where you've been thinking, well, it's not really on stage and it's not really off stage. Perhaps it's more like this diagram, and this is where onstage and offstage have been combined. If you look at the light yellow, that's all the areas where the staff are working. And so where the pink seats are on the left in the waiting, uh, the patients are actually coming up the perimeter and into the exam rooms, which gives the providers and MA kind of that ballroom in the middle, but also an offstage at the end of that ballroom. So, it's not always black and white, but knowing those principles of onstage and offstage is helpful in analyzing the spaces that you have. We also talked a little bit about alternative exam rooms. The first one that you see with the purple arrow and the orange arrow, think of the purple arrow as the patient, P for patient, and the orange one is for the staff entering the room off of a traditional hall. But we have two others, and that's where they come from different directions. And so that's an offstage entry for the staff, and it's directly from the entry for the patient into the exam room. This is an, a way of addressing some of the challenges we saw in the very first slide of that old waiting room. How can we disperse those people? How can we check them in, get them closer to the exam room, and actually make it a quieter uh, environment that's less stressful for the patients as they're waiting to go into the exam room. So let's look at what that looks like from the patient's standpoint. This is a cutoff. So I am looking into the room, say from the door, and see there's another door that goes into the staff work area. The exam room doesn't look a whole lot different. It's usually a little bit deeper to accommodate two doors. Um, but there is the patient side of the entry, and then there is the staff entry. If you want to see how this works, um, look at Midmark. They have a good example online. It, this is the workflow E, and you can kind of, they'll walk you through that in a little uh, video clip. Dual access offstage uh, is also the pattern that's been developed by the Department of Veterans Affairs for all of their new uh, clinic sites, so you will start seeing those across the country. 
where this is different than the one I showed you that was the yellow where they had both on stage and off stage, this is clearly all off stage because now you have dual access rooms. So look at the at the orange, that's where patients are entering the room. The green is where the staff are entering the room. So instead of little hallways, we've now narrowed it down and we've entered just a single room instead of a, a hallway of rooms on both sides. Still maintaining that T. So there's workspace through the middle and then there's group space and quiet work uh, at the end of the T, which is on the right of your screen. This is a picture of what a layout like that uh, can look like. It doesn't have to look this way. Sometimes they're wider um, and the desks are perpendicular to as they go down the hall, different kinds of layouts. But in, notice that they are not lined up against the wall. People are very conscious of each other and what each other's doing and they have a line of sight to the exam rooms for a lot of nonverbal communication. So, that's kind of a, an overview of the principles of how is my space designed. They all have challenges. So we're going to walk through some of those challenges and some ways to address them. The first is this concept of group work. Most of those diagrams, I did not show you pictures of group work. And I would have to tell you most places, they totally forget about group work this concept of clinically based conference rooms. So it's not a conference room over an admin that I can go to at lunch because I have a meeting. It's instead a small group work area within the clinical spaces. Those layouts that were T's, um, you would notice in the top T, which was always on the right of your screens, that there was a room like this that was a group room or small clinical conference room. You might be able to squeeze that out of a, of a place that you're not currently working. In fact, I gave you an alternative for the underused procedure room. I have seen some groups who have taken that underused procedure room and said, you know, we don't really need that exam room. If we could work better together, we could do it with the exam rooms that we currently have designated as traditional exam rooms. And they've turned that procedure room into a small group room. Uh, we're not talking about a place for big groups. We're not talking about a place to sit all afternoon, but really just for um, check-ins, for, for doing case reviews, for working through problems, maybe for the morning huddles, for the afternoon cuddles, um, if you use that term. Uh, but they need to be accessible. They need to be inclusive. So they can't just belong in one team and then the other team doesn't have them. Uh, light filled is nice, primarily because if the group gets together, it should be a stress decreasing time and not a stress increasing time. So if possible, try to make this spot in a room that has natural light to help decrease the stress and get people ready to go back to work. IT strong, that sounds pretty obvious, except I have actually been in many group rooms conference rooms, teamwork rooms, where people are walking around trying to get a signal. Uh, so make sure they're IT strong for phones, uh, for computers, for any kind of equipment you might be using. Right size. We do not need these places to be huge because it is very stressful, very uncomfortable to do work of three or four people in a great big room. So too small, and too big are both a problem. Flexible and sustainable. A good rule of thumb, I think, for operational sustainability is that any space you have in your building should be flexible enough to be able to be used 80% of the time that you're in, that you're open and in the building. It may, so this group space may become a quiet workspace when it's not a group. Maybe there's someone in there finishing charting or there's someone doing a research project or someone who is talking to another staff person and they're having a conversation. Uh, group work and quiet work can overlap. And so we have a need for both. It's possible to use the same for both. It's also possible to have specific rooms for quiet work, which we ironically call talking rooms. So it helps the, the large rooms stay quieter 
because when I'm having a conversation with one person, instead of this very loud whisper uh, that sounds kind of like white noise going through the team room, I have a place right off of the team room where we can slip in and have a conversation. Likewise, I can go in there and have a conversation with a patient or a patient's parent on the phone quietly without a lot of background noise. One of the big uh, dissatisfactions that we get from patient satisfaction surveys is when we're not talking about the on-site experience, when we're talking about the care that you get from the team when you are off-site, is this idea that they don't concentrate and focus on me because I hear all this noise in the background. It sounds kind of like when a telemarketer calls me and it doesn't feel like they really care about what I'm trying to say. We get that feedback a lot in different formats, but we get it a lot and we need to think about not only can I hear, but what is the patient hearing when I'm trying to talk to them on the phone? So uses for quiet spaces. Do make them adjacent to the team room. I'm not talking about the quiet spaces that are uh, down the hall or on another floor. Uh, sometimes people create provider lounges on the upper floor and we've got six floors in an urban area of clinical space. And then the upper floor has a provider lounge and you never see anyone in there. Well, if I wanna make a phone call, I am not gonna to go to the elevator, go up the elevator, go to that room, make the phone call, come back down, and then as soon as I get off the elevator, somebody says, where were you? I was looking for you. So we need to be realistic about this and not waste precious square footage on spaces that look nice and are intended to help with recruitment and retention but actually show a lack of understanding about the workflow and the needs of the team. So make these places adjacent. They could be dual access. I have seen some where you can walk in from one side off of the hall and one from the team room. Uh, important not to have them in the workstation count. So these are not just become somebody's office, but they're truly neutral spaces. I also think it's important that there's a line of sight from those rooms into the team room. That is really optimal. So I've even seen some teams turn their storage uh, that's off of the room. So I used an example earlier of a medical records room that had been turned into uh, a team room. Sometimes those rooms have storage closets. Try putting a glass door on a storage closet and turning it into a, a talking room but I need to be able to see what's going on in the room so that I'm comfortable continuing what I'm doing and not jumping in. And my MA needs to be able to see what I'm doing so she's not interrupting me if I'm on the phone, but certainly signaling to me if the next patient's ready. So line of sight, but with a door is really important. The other challenge we have is sharing natural light. There is never enough light and light is very, very powerful. So it's not only important because we enjoy light, but it is a sig it's kind of a symbol of power. Uh, that whole concept in business of working your way up the ladder until you get a corner office, if you've never thought about it, is it really because I have my office in the corner? No, it's because I have two window walls. And the fact that I have twice as much natural light as anyone else, because I am more important and I worked up to that. That's why we see natural light in executive offices. We might see a medical director's office with a window, and yet we have the person that is at the call center on the phone all day in a closet with no window. The medical director's in meetings and seeing patients all day. He goes in that room perhaps an hour a day. The other person sits in the room eight hours a day. Which one should have the natural light? See, natural light is so powerful, it also is powerful to send a message of equity among the teams and light as part of what is it you need in order to do your job effectively. Just like we wouldn't hold, withhold computers from people who needed computers. Oh, wait. Actually, we do do that. Um, I was at a health center a few weeks ago where all the providers had their own computer and the MAs had to share a computer. 
and then they were having some problems with flow, which is why I was there. So I'm like, well, how about if we just all had our own computer? We do the same thing with light. So think about light. And then there's, of course, the practical issue of, well, how do I do that? One is window wall, as you see on the left. The other is uh, actually a picture of a skylight, but then that light through a plexiglass pane coming into an interior hall. So it can be exterior light from an exterior window, or perhaps you can bring light into an interior space using light tubes or even using um, a ceiling access. Minimizing noise, this is the big one. How do we get all of these people in a room working together and not make it so noisy nobody can think straight? Uh, one is let's absorb some of the sound which we can't eliminate. So first start by absorbing sound. You can incorporate carpet into the actual office space. I wouldn't put it in the hallways. I certainly wouldn't put it in exam rooms. But sometimes we lay carpet in the actual workspace to help to absorb noise. You can also put sound absorbing ceiling tiles in. Ceiling tiles and carpet actually have about the same effect. So if you have found some improvement with carpet, if you put sound absorbing ceiling tiles in, you can expect to double that benefit. The other very inexpensive thing to do is on the walls. So we've talked about ceilings and floors. On the walls, we can put what we call buffer boards. There's a picture of one there. It's nothing more than a stretcher frame with fabric pulled over it, but use a stretcher frame and not just a picture frame because the key is that air gap between the fabric and the wall when you hang it up is going to help to absorb noise. This is a great thing to use if you have people who are on the phone a lot and their sound is bouncing back. Put this on the wall in the direction that they're speaking and it will help to absorb some of that sound. The other is to mask sounds and you can use uh, sound masking machines the one I pictured there is probably the most popular in the United States. I see them on the floor outside of therapy rooms all the time, outside of uh, offices some of the time, but they simply are white noise machines. I'd encourage you though to walk around your site tomorrow and make sure if you have these, they're in the right place. Uh, as they move around, as people kind of move themselves around, sometimes I find that they have actually created more noise than helping to mask noise because they have ended up in spaces where people are trying to hear each other. If you have a sound masking machine and you have a conversation right next to it, you're going to speak loudly because you have to speak over the machine. The key is to put them in the space between the person who is talking and the person you don't want to hear. So if you have a behavioral health room, you would not have one of these in the room, you would have it in the hall right outside that room so that the nurse who's sitting at her desk in that hallway is not hearing the conversation. But sometimes they make themselves their way into rooms or one time I saw one inside an MA workroom and so they were all working, trying to get meds, trying to do all this stuff. Next to them were two consult rooms and they were actually speaking much more loudly than they normally would because they were speaking over the sound masking machine and the sound masking machine should have gone in the hall and down the hall outside the doors of the behavioral health room, not inside their room. So do a walk around your site, make sure you have them in the optimal space. You can also put this a white noise machine on off um, via your computer. So obviously there are security issues, downloading issues, but there are plenty of YouTube and white noise um, soundtracks that you can use. I do see people using those sometimes in team rooms uh, when they're trying to concentrate. Maybe most effectively is to support low volume conversation. Let's just eliminate some of the noise. Instead of trying to absorb it or mask it, let's eliminate it. Uh, create alcoves for those noisy machines. Provide talking rooms, which we've already spoken about. Be 
A uh, third one is to position workstations to enhance eye contact. I do not speak as loudly if I am looking at you as if I am speaking into a room and trying to get your attention. So if you are sitting at your desk and I'm at the door, I will speak more loudly to get your attention than if I am able to look you eye to eye and then speak. On a practical basis, what this looks like is first optimize lines of sight. So the one on the left is how we often outfit our team rooms or our work rooms or our call, uh, call rooms or even our billing offices um, where people are looking at the walls and they have their backs to each other. And even more importantly, they have their back to the door. So the blue arrow is to indicate someone coming in and trying to get the attention of someone working there. Except for that very first desk, they're going to have to walk between those people, come up behind them and interrupt them. Takes more time, is more disruptive, or they yell from the door, which is louder. If you switched it so that these people were all perpendicular to the two walls and they all could see the door, you could increase nonverbal communication. People would be more aware of what's happening in the room and that would decrease conversation and also decrease traffic. So play with, there again, don't buy new furniture, but you might want to rotate it 90 degrees and see what happens. Also, encourage your teams to embrace the team. Uh, many people have gone into team rooms and wish that they never had done that. They didn't want to be in there. And so they create, as I have on the left, these four little desks that kind of when you sit at it, if you close your eyes, you can pretend you still are in your private office. That is kind of getting all the negative of a team room and gaining nothing as far as collaboration. Where on the right, people are aware of each other, they're facing each other. You can still have some privacy um, dividers between them if you want. More importantly, because we're aware of what's going on in the room, conversation goes down. So I always arrange call centers this way on the right because voices will be lower than if you arrange it like the way on the left. Finally, creating a place for team respite. So we talked a lot about where they work. Where do they escape? And do they need an escape? Yes, they do. Because if we have a chance to escape and just clear your head, uh, it helps in interactions. If we're working all together and I can just step away and clear my head, it may help me not respond inappropriately. It may help me not get so stressed that I snap at the next patient. So restorative escapes are really, really important. When I worked uh, in the hospital, so out of the primary care team environment, I'll give you an example so it won't feel too personal and too much like I was kind of watching you yesterday. Uh, in the hospital, our med room was our restorative escape. And it was really kind of funny because if you unlocked the med room and went in there because you had clearly had enough and someone was already in there crying their eyes out, it was really irritating because that was your restorative escape. Well, let's try to create places that really do work for restorative escape. Also a reality check. Um, we need to kind of know that our experience is normal we need a place to talk about that that's safe, that's out of patient's earshot. We also need to have a personal connection. Uh, we don't want staff chit-chatting about their personal lives all during work, uh, but they do need that personal connection. So if there's no place or time to do it, they will do it during work, and then that's problematic. The spaces we create need to complement the work zone. So there is a really big difference and uh, this shift towards team rooms as opposed to smaller distributed work areas in that now the respite areas need to be more distributed and more varied. We cannot just take a group that's been sitting together the last four hours, put them in a cafeteria style room for lunch and expect them to feel less stressed. So it's important that we change our spaces for respite when we change our spaces for work. Um, then we have to get them right 
we don't have to get them all alike. So you could even take a large room if you have it and maybe subdivide it now. Maybe you have some small tables and chairs. Maybe you have some soft uh, seating. A good rule of thumb, I, well, let me rephrase that. The rule of thumb, if you have a space that has been created for a break area or a respite area, is a third of the people who are working at any one time in the building are accommodated in the break area. I'm not sure if you were aware of that, but architects never intend everyone to be in the staff break room at once. Operationally, we do, and this is one of the big misalignments that I see, is that the expectation of the staff is that we can all eat together, and it was never designed for that. So if that is an expectation, think about how you might put conference rooms or some of those group, group work areas, or maybe some uh, staff lounge areas adjacent and create kind of a suite effect so that more people can be accommodated at one time. And then of course, there's the here and there and all in one place, kind of like, do we distribute them? We've talked about that a little bit. I've put um, also some rules of thumb for space, about 20 square feet per staff person at any one time is what a break room will comfortably accommodate. We squeeze a whole lot more things in there, but if you look at the size of your break room, divide it by 20, that's about how many people it ideally would accommodate. Now that's with kitchen uh, utensils, refrigerators, all that kind of thing. Or you might just have some beverage alcove. Here's a atmosphere exercise you can do with your staff. Um, take this, copy it, at will, they're just pictures off online. They're, um, they are not anything like the staff respite areas you're going to make on purpose. I did not use pictures of staff break areas, but I did use pictures that are totally different on where people would have lunch. And actually have staff put a little star, like some people use gold stars, some people use little check marks, some people use initials on the which one would they prefer to have for their lunch area? Very telling as to whether you're working with introverts or extroverts. Also very telling on the impact of the team room on the need for respite. Um, perhaps three years ago, I wanted the one on the right, but now that I'm in a team room, I long for something more like on the left. So uh, good indicators to help you design your respite areas appropriately. Putting it all together. First of all, look at your old spaces in new ways. Uh, replacement, perhaps, renovation, maybe, but you can always repurpose, you can always reorganize, which is exactly what this car um, lot did when they just had too many cars. Uh, this is actually from Manhattan. Foster balance for effective teamwork. We were all separate and we were not working well together. Then we all went together in one room, and that's not ideal either. There has to be a balance between spaces for quiet work, focused work, and for teamwork, and you need to be able to accommodate both. So if you're having trouble with the function of the team, first look at whether you have spaces that would accommodate quiet, focused work, group work, and collaborative work, all three, or is there a gap? And then align your operations. The people, process, and place of the primary care team all work together. So if you just keep changing processes, 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 or you just keep hiring more people and you're not getting to where um, you want to be, consider the impact of place. And are you working with your space the way it is? Could you work more effectively with it the way it is? Or do you need to reorganize it and make it look different? Here's some contact information if you have questions afterwards, and I'd be happy to take whatever questions have come in, Craig. That's great. Um, thank you. There were a couple I answered uh, right on the on the spot. So, um, Perfect. Cindy, if you could uh, take a second and just go through what does Capital Link offer in this regard? Um, I think you have the list here, your pre-publications and stuff. Do you help folks looking for some design ideas? What is your, what's CapLink's role in this? Sure. Um, so I am the, my title at Capital Link is the Operations and Facilities Planner. And that means I get to work full time 
uh, trying to reach alignment of people, place, and process. And so I work in operational processes and uh, orienting teams and getting them to work more effectively together, but also in aligning places. So in, I do a lot of work in new spaces when you're designing new buildings. I also look at reorganizing spaces and using uh, existing spaces more effectively. I, could, I can come to health centers and do that. That's a fee-based uh, technical assistance. And you can contact me if you'd like someone to come in and do that. And we can talk about what those fees would look like. They're quite varied depending on what your need is. There also are materials on our website that have been prepared to help you kind of think of your spaces differently, particularly if you are looking at trying to create a new space, a brand new space, and what should you do as far as the pre-work to make sure that space is aligned with your philosophy, your vision, and your patient population. So you can find some toolkits, you can find some um, kind of handouts that you can give to your staff to, to look at and then to use as discussion points. And those are all free. Um, there are also some other webinars that we've done on similar topics, and you can access those on the website. Um, and I just have running a little short on time, so I'm going to ask one more question just because I, I have 14 more of my own. But um, to your point on those handouts, the, the team voting, I like the stars that you spoke of, of. And then you also mentioned whether your staff were introverts or extroverts. Yeah. To this whole space, to this whole discussion that you've just had, um, who's on the team that's deciding um, whether we have uh, you know, these these different rooms, the, the desks facing a different way, the divider on this, who is part of that process um, and what makes it uh, happen most effectively? Okay, great question. And I'll answer it differently based on whether you're looking at a brand new space, like a new facility you're designing, then you will want a planning team that has probably seven to 14 people on it that has a representative from each of the roles of the people who are going to be using the space. Um, now they don't need, you don't have to have like one MA, one nurse, one front desk person. You need to have somebody on the team that understands what people, how people work. So it's more like I did your job last year. I now have this job. I kind of get how they interact. And then, because you want staff to feel like the group that planned a new space understood how I work. I had a voice there and you certainly take input, but have a voice. So, but in existing spaces, so if I open a satellite, say, and I have a new site, how do you want to organize it? It is probably the cheapest and most effective team building exercise you can ever have is to talk about space because it's not personal. When you talk about process, it gets into they don't, we don't. Uh, when you talk about place, we it's something that we all have in common and nobody really owns it. And so it's a great team building exercise to actually have the whole team discuss this and then the team to assign maybe two or three people to work out some solutions and bring them back to the team. I have a I have follow up questions on that, but I am running out of time. So, Cindy, thank you very much for your time. I was going to ask how often you do that. What uh, you know, how often you do this? Not just when you open this up. But I have a bunch of questions bouncing around my head. Your presentation was terrific. I really appreciate it. I think everybody on the phone really appreciate it. Please stick around to do the evaluation at the end of this. Um, I will say that you can meet Cindy at our conference at the end of the summer. She will be at, presenting at our annual conference here in DC. Please go to our website to log in and register uh, for our conference. I will tell you that the lowest rate possible for the conference expires at the end of this week. So um, this is an opportune time for you to register for our conference right now as fast as you can <laughs> until Friday. Um, and again, you can you can meet Cindy in person and ask her these questions that you have about this or go through the, a different presentation that she'll be making there um, at our annual conference. 
Also a reminder, the slides are available. We will be emailing this out to you, all of your participants, and also posting it online. And also our next series, our next webinar series, next webinar in this series, sorry, is next week, June 13th by Dr. Fred Rockman, which is Thriving as a Learning Healthcare System in Primary Care. Dr. Rockman is the CEO of the Alliance of Chicago and also presented on this similar topic at our conference last year as well. As you can see, we have some great topics at our conference. We're happy to have you. And we're also happy to have you today at this webinar series. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Cindy, for the presentation. And please just take a minute to fill out the evaluation. Thank you very much. Thank you.